AP Psychology Confusing Pairs, Part 2. Sympathetic and Parasympathetic Nervous Systems. These are both part of the autonomic nervous system. The sympathetic fight or flight response uh, is activated when we experience fear, loud noises, and previously learned um, fear responses. Sympathetic nervous system uh, you know, it activates the, the adrenaline, um, digestion stops, blood flow increases, heart rate increases, etc. The parasympathetic nervous system is calming you down, much like after you've been free falling and then you have the parachute, where you just flow down to earth. You're calm and relaxed. Yeah, I know that's kind of a creepy voice. Neurotransmitters, uh, they are in the nervous system, but sometimes the same chemicals can be in the endocrine system in the bloodstream, and in that case, they're going to be hormones. So hormones, raging hormones, that's going to be the endocrine system. So it's going to be the bloodstream and the various glands that you've got. And the neurotransmitters are going to be in the nervous system working with neurons, neurotransmitters. Lateral hypothalamus is one part of the hypothalamus. Remember, the hypothalamus uh, deals with uh, hunger, thirst, body temperature, and sex. And so when you've got the lateral hypothalamus working, it will stimulate hunger. If you lesion that part of the brain, it, you will no longer get hungry. The ventral medial hypothalamus suppresses hunger. And what I always like to do with the, the ventral medial is talk about the hyperphagic rat, the fat rat. If you no longer can suppress your hunger, you will always be hungry, and then you will continue to eat. And then you will have this rat that is three times the normal size of the rat. Um, or in this case, um, some people who can't seemingly um, control their hunger, and they eat and eat and eat and eat. Broca's area makes words. That's at the, the part of the brain in the motor cortex. And when you think broca, think the Spanish word for mouth, boca. And so Broca's area, Boca, Broca, that's the one that makes the words. Broca's area helps with speech. If that, if that is broken, if that is no longer functioning, that's Broca's aphasia. Wernicke's area, that's the comprehension of words, the comprehension of language, and that's back near the um, temporal parietal area. So Wernicke's is comprehension, Broca's is production. Identical twins versus fraternal twins. Identical twins, you've got a single egg, splits, thereby having clones of the same person. Fraternal twins are two different eggs in utero that are fertilized. Two different eggs, therefore, could even have two different genders. That's why a lot of fraternal twins are male-female. Two different eggs, two different sperm, two different uh, X and Y chromosomes. Afferent and efferent neurons. Afferent neurons are sensory neurons. They go from the body to the brain. How do they affect you? The body to the brain. Whereas efferent, or trying to effect change, is the motor neurons. It's the brain to the body. Assimilation. This is one of my all-time favorite ideas. Fitting new information into your existing schema. Assimilation is a, an idea from Piaget. And it's when uh, you try to make whatever new info that you have, whether it's new learning or just new experiences, you try to connect it to what you already know. One example is all four-legged animals are doggies. Or as I used to say to my, my dog, hey, look, that's a big dog. It's when I saw a horse out the car window. Another example of this is uh, from the movie Monsters, Inc. When Boo, the little girl, calls Sullivan the monster, big furry four-legged thing, calls him Kitty. That's an example of assimilation. Compare that to accommodation, which is actually changing your schema and understanding that doggies are different than kitties and that Sully is not really a kitty at all. Uh, accommodation is changing your schema. It's creating the change itself. Concrete operations versus formal operations. Two different steps in the Piaget's cognitive development stages. Concrete operations, you can start thinking logically, step A, step B, step C, versus formal operations, and that's when you can get into the philosophical thinking, the what if, the let's play out this scenario kind of an idea. When you have that kind of thinking, 
uh, not everybody gets there, by the way. And that's one of the interesting things about American politics is not everybody gets to formal operations. And so, uh, Piaget, and Piaget did mention that, it, not the political part, but the idea that not everybody gets to the formal operation stage. But it's the more complex, philosophical, what-if kind of thinking that we've got. Rods and Cones. Not just a song by the Blue Man Group, but rather two different receptors in the retina, in the back of the eye. The rods, and you see uh, night vision. That's where you have your gray scale. Rods deal with uh, grays and blacks and whites. Whereas cones deal with color vision. Cones, color, color cones, color cones. So color vision is dealt with in the cones in the retina. Classical versus operant conditioning. Classical, Watson, the idea of connecting an involuntary reflexive or autonomic response, drawing out that behavior and associating it with something that previously had never been connected to it. Classical conditioning is sometimes also known as associational learning, but all of your responses are learned by involuntary reflexive or autonomic responses. They're drawn out uh, by, the, uh, by the stimulus. Whereas operant conditioning, that's B.F. Skinner, and that's where we look at voluntary behaviors that are emitted. We're looking at behaviors that then an organism does, and then is the behavior uh, given a consequence that makes it more likely, reinforcement, or punished, less likely to occur. And so it's one of those things where operant is voluntary behavior, Skinner. Classical conditioning is involuntary or reflexive behavior, and that's going to be Watson. Primacy and recency effect. You may recall from the, uh, the memory chapter, there is the uh, the serial position effect. So when given a list of words, you tend to remember the beginning and the end of the list. That together is the serial position effect. The primacy effect is the first items in the list are remembered. The recency effect is the last items in the list are remembered. So it's all part of the same idea of serial position effect. Implicit versus explicit memory. Implicit are non-declarative memories, they are skills, they are the kind of memory that you can call up and just kind of do automatically. You don't have to give conscious thought to it, you just do it. The basal ganglia is going to be involved a lot with this particular kind of memory. That's one of the reasons why the people who have anterograde amnesia, they cannot create new memories, still can create new habits because it's not the cerebral cortex or the hippocampus that it's at work, it's the basal ganglia. And then explicit memory is literally the facts that you can recall, the items that you bring to conscious mind and you deal with. Recall versus recognition. When you take the AP test, you notice that there is a recall part, that's the FRQ, and then the recognition part and that's where you get the hints. So the multiple choice part is the recognition. You're able to choose a correct answer because you recognize it. Some of us who are really good guessers on multiple choice exams really benefit from that. Whereas recall, you have to come up with it on your own. You have to pull it out of your brain in order to be able to get that information out there. Total recall, I think of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Not really, I know that was a really, really bad impression. Algorithms. This goes to the cognition unit. Uh, algorithms are step by step, literally step by step, step one, step two, step three, step four, when you're solving a problem. And you do it that same way every time. And that's actually the, the kind of things that computers will use when they are scanning your YouTube videos for content that's already there, that is copyright protected. Versus heuristics. Humans use this a lot. It's a rule of thumb. So you don't attack every multiple choice question the same way. You have an idea of, well, you read the stem and see if you can uh, take that stem and predict the answer. Sometimes you will follow that one. Sometimes you're like, oh, this is a really long stem. I want to have to read this a couple of times. So you, you, you have a, some general ideas that you're going to go with, but it's not a step A, step B, step C, every time sort of a process. It's a rule of thumb. Representative heuristic. These are going to be related to stereotypes. Um, to what extent 
does the thing that you're seeing represent an idea, a framework that's already in your mind? So when you have a problem, when you're encountering a question, to what extent does this, this example bring to mind a representation of what you already know? Versus the availability heuristic. Again, this is cognition. So when you think of an availability heuristic, how easily does something come to mind? The classic is in the, the Zimbardo film where Daniel Kahneman is talking about the, the words that begin with the letter K versus words that have the letter K as the third letter. How easily does that come to mind? And because the letter, uh, letter K is the first letter, comes first in your mind, you think there are more words with that. So what, what comes to mind mo and is most available to your mind. Phonemes and morphemes. Phonemes are the basic sound units in linguistics. B, P, A, D, F, N, M. Those are basic sound units. They don't mean anything by themselves. They don't have meaning. They're just sounds, phonemes. Whereas morphemes have meaning, and the, the morphemes uh, are going to be the smallest units that have meaning. I, may, can, it. And those different meanings will make up larger words later on. But morphemes, meanings, M&M, &M, morphemes, meanings. Fluid intelligence versus crystallized intelligence. This is Sternberg's idea uh, when he deals with intelligence. Fluid intelligence is processing speed. How quick are you at solving particular issues and problems? How, f how quickly can you come up with the answer? Versus crystallized intelligence, which is how much do you know? Crystallized just is his way of saying you've been able to achieve a lot of information, and so this AP test will measure your crystallized intelligence about this particular topic, psychology. Validity. Does a test measure what it says it's supposed to measure? How valid is it? Versus reliability, how consistently do you get the same scores on that same test? So if you're taking the SAT, does it measure what it's supposed to measure? Does it have validity? Does it have reliability? Do you get roughly the same score each time you take the SAT test? Achievement tests versus aptitude. Achievement tests measure how much you know, what you've learned. Example, the AP Psych test is designed to measure what you've learned about the topic of advanced placement psychology, about psychology in general, versus an aptitude test, which is predictive it's designed to tell you how likely you are to be able to do something in the future. So the SAT is a pretty good predictor of how well you're going to do academically in your freshman year of college. That's why schools use it, because it has pretty decent predictive power. Intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. Intrinsic, inside yourself. Why are you doing this? Perhaps you're doing this because you, uh, have your, you, you just want to get a 5 on the AP Psych exam. You have that drive. You have that desire. You're doing it because you like psych. Versus extrinsic motivation. If you get a 5 on your AP Psych exam, maybe your parents are going to give you 100 bucks. Maybe you're going to get a grade bump because you are taking an AP Psych test. Extrinsic motivation. Intrinsic is internal. Extrinsic is external. Theory Y theory versus Theory X. These are two theories that were brought up by a, uh, an MIT researcher back in the 1950s looking at workers in the workplace. And with Theory X, the researcher said, you know, workers are basically lazy, and so they respond well to rewards or punishment, the external stuff. Versus Theory Y, workers tend to be ambitious, and so you can deal with a, a you can create a more democratic sort of a workplace, more um, uh, intrinsically motivated um, structure. And he said that companies tended to have one or the other of these particular structures. I've never seen this particular topic on an AP Psych test. Perhaps it'll be there, 
but uh, theory X and theory Y is motivational in the workplace. So this is an IO psych question. Theory X, workers are lazy. Internal locus of control, external locus of control. In an internal locus of control, you control the environment. You make the decisions. You exert your free will on your environment, on your life. An external locus of control, the environment controls you. Well, it's in the stars. It was fate. Someone else, something else made the decision for you. Internal locus of control uh, uh, versus external locus of control. Where do you believe your life is controlled from? Inside yourself and your own decisions or something external to you? Lithium versus Librium. Lithium or lithium carbonate is a heavy metal uh, medication that treats bipolar disorder. Whereas Librium, sometimes known as Librax, treats anxiety. So one is designed to treat bipolar disorder, the other, Librium, is designed to treat anxiety. Type A versus type B personalities. This will probably be in your health psych, or, yeah, uh, health psych uh, chapter. Um, type A is going to be your driven, success-oriented, have to get it done at all costs, high-stress person. Versus your type B, oh, dude, just take it, relax, man. Yeah, this is all right. This is wonderful, man. Um, type B personalities are very low stress. They're just not feeling your stress. Type A's, you say hello and they're stressed. They just have that driven. And type A's are more prone to heart attacks. And that's it for the confusing pairs. Keep on studying and reviewing the material to ensure your success on the AP Psych exam.